let's see here. Okay. <clears throat> um, we had uh, we had a couple. Uh, we are recording this now, and so I want to welcome everybody that's here and and uh, appreciate seeing some from from Keswick, Canada area, and, and uh, so we appreciate having y'all with us too. We do have some families out at the school co-op meeting tonight, so we got a few families that are out to that. Um, I talked, uh, we had a couple of questions on Monday night's Zoom meeting that we have with the Dominican Republic and Mexico people. And um, um, let's see, one of the questions we had was, where is, where are the people, the saints in the early church of the New Testament that died? Are they in heaven or where are they? Then the other question was, was in Revelations, Six, where uh, I don't remember, it, I believe that was the last verse in Re Revelation 6, yeah, 17, that says, um, for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? So that was a couple of the questions that we had. And that actually led into, um, in fact, I'm not sure how we got on uh, clouds, Jesus coming in clouds. And uh, so that's what we, we taught some of, you know, I, I gave scriptures on, uh, well, as a matter of fact, let's see here. Uh, I'm trying to remember how we got on the clouds and in, in that meeting. Uh, Sometimes what if we go over something there that I think would be good for us to have, I'll, I'll talk on it some here. Um, of course, I, I, um, <clears throat> I mentioned uh, um, the saints back there in the early church. And of course, the question didn't, it really didn't identify whether or not we, they were talking about bride members, just saints. And so I stated that those that made the bride in the early church uh, were in, that they were in heaven. Uh, and the reason this question came up was because uh, of these souls under the altar. We had discussed that in the 11th verse of Revelation 6. Um, I, I have went over that here pretty good. I don't know if I did with any of the people from Canada here, but um, of course, I, uh, I'll state this again, that the seven seals that are given in the book of Revelation, starting in the sixth verse, of course, I think everyone is pretty knowledgeable to the fact that it, you know, that of the four horses, the first seal was opened, which was the white horse, gives very little information. He that sat on him had a bow and crown was given to him and he went forth conquering and to conquer. That's it. That's the information we had in the 
in the first seal, and then the second seal was a red horse, and then the third seal was the, the black horse, and then the fourth seal, the pale horse, which these seals are talking about the um, symbolically prophecy uses horses as the church. Uh, I'll give you a scripture on that in Joel, Joel, the second chapter. Um, let's see what verse that would be in. Um, Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, in the, I guess, in the second verse of Joel 2, it says, A day of darkness and of gloominess. As a matter of fact, let me, let me uh, give you a screenshot here. Oops. Hot host disabled participant screen sharing. You're going to have to allow it, Brother Painter. It's disabled. I think you can allow it. You see anywhere on the host for more? Click on more. Does it show that you can allow screen sharing? Um, I'm looking here. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. It says I can allow a record, record local files, allow to multi pin, but that's all that it gives me offer. Uh, what about the three little buttons up there on your? That's just a pin, isn't it? Yeah. Well, allow what it says you can allow. Let's see if that opens it up. Okay, and it's going to be for you. So. Okay. And so you're allowed to share local files and multi-pin. Oh, uh, still says screen sharing is disabled by the host. It doesn't give me an option to not do that. Let me try something else here. Okay, give me the host back for just a minute. Let me see if I can uh, maybe we just see what happens. You're the host. There we go. I don't know why that did that, but it did. Okay, I'll research it. So Huh? Okay. I think y'all can see my, uh, let me open my Bible up. How about that? Okay, here in the second chapter of Joel, second verse, a day of darkness, gloomous day of clouds and a thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. This is talking about the New Testament church. If you remember, Peter said on the day of Pentecost, this is that was spoken of by the prophet Joel. There have not been ever the like. There's never been any people like this and shall neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations, which I think that uh, indicates that the latter house, the restored church down here, that there would be a people like that. A fire devours before them, that's judgment. The judgment of God came in the early church, and behind them a flame burneth, and the land is as the Garden of Eden before them, which Eden is a type of the holy place. Uh, you know, uh, Adam and Eve was in Eden. That was a place that sin was not permitted. Uh, they had enough knowledge to live above it. That's why. And that's a picture of the early church. In, in second heaven condition 
and behind them a desolate wilderness. That's a picture of the falling, the church falling away, uh, the Gentile church falling, falling away after the early church was harvested, then the gospel went to the Gentiles, but the church fell away, and and nothing shall escape them. It won't escape the judgment back there. And the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and as horsemen. So shall they run. And just showing you that symbolically here, the, their appearance is as horses. That's a type of the church. Um, likewise, the noise of chariots on the top of mountains. So they're... Uh, they're depicted here in prophecy as, as the church being symbolically like a horse. So that's what I was saying here in, in uh, mm, in in the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation, those four horses. That's that's why we're using the the uh and giving uh, the symbol of those horses being the church. And of course, I'm sure all of y'all know that uh, that's, that's talking about um, that the white horse was the early church in a divine order. It's white because it's righteous, red, sinner, sin entered into it. The, the rider changed. Jesus was no longer the rider, man was. And so the church was falling, then it went to black and dark, you know, darkness or ignorance, lack of knowledge, the church had fell away. And then it came to a pale horse, death was the rider, which was the Catholic church, hell followed with him. That's not talking about any literal burning hell, neither is it talking about the grave there, right there, it's talking about a hellish condition uh, well, there was no life. Death was the rider of the horse. There was no anointing from God in the Catholic Church once it was set up and ruled the world for 1260 years. But then it continues on, and here's what I'm telling you. These seals are, are in chronological order. You cannot take these. the next seal, the fifth seal, he saw under the altar, the souls of them that were slain for the for the word of God and for the testimony they held. Uh, and so these souls under the altar were not anyone in the early church. These were after the Catholic Church, the chronological order of the church. And so therefore, uh, they were... Uh, they were after the Catholic Church was established, so these souls under the altar, I'm saying that they were martyrs by the Catholic Church, people that suffered the persecution of the Catholic Church and that were martyred, and they were no longer able to, and they cried out, oh, long, oh Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge our, avenge our blood? Well, I've, I'm, I, I'm, I don't want to, you know, just belabor the point, but uh, these people were, the people in the early church, they were avenged by AD 70. The judgment, I read to you in Joel how that nothing escaped them. They were, that world was judged. The Jews were cut off and the gospel was given to the Gentiles because they refused to accept Christ. I'm talking about those that did refuse, those that did accept uh, accept Christ as, as the Messiah and the Savior and came into the body of Christ, those that did overcome and make the bride, I do say they're not under any altar, they're in heaven. I use the scripture in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelations. I'll go to it here to show that the, the angel that talked with John, um, right here, let's see. Mm. 
in the ninth and 10th verse there, it says, and he saith unto me, right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb and saith unto me, these are true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Uh, this, this angel that he fell at his feet was telling him, don't, don't, don't worship me. I'm your fellow servant and of thy brethren. He, he does this again in the 22nd chapter. And uh, we just go to that. Uh, and the angel then tells him, I'm of thy brethren, the prophets. Let's see. Right here in the ninth verse. Uh, eighth verse, I, John, saw these things, heard them. When I heard them, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel. That word angel means messenger, which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, see thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant and of the prophets brethren, the prophets, and of them that keep the sayings of this book. See, a uh, third heaven angel that's uh, always been an angel as celestial being in heaven with God is not someone that had to keep the sayings of the book. They're righteous. Any, I mean, they're, they were made to serve God and do his will. Um, but he's telling him here, and I am your fellow servant and of thy brethren, the prophets. And, and so obviously this person here was a human on earth and they're in heaven now and God's even using them even to reveal to John what they've learned since they've been in heaven. No doubt this is, these are, the, this is a bride member in heaven. Uh, now if you go back to the to the 19th chapter, after, I'm just reiterating some things I've already said in the past, but after God judges Babylon in the 18th chapter of the book of Revelation, first he gets all of his people out of Babylon, which is all of this conglomeration of Christendom that are controlled by organizations. That's not Bible order, and that's not, you know, God's not, God will never, uh, no, I mean, God's people are out there, but he's going to get them out of there. Come out of her, my people in 18 chap in this 18 chapter, the fourth chapter. But God finally, once he gets everyone that will hear him out of Babylon into the body of Christ, then he will judge that system. And in the 19th verse here, the first verse, it said, after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, say it, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth and her for with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of her servants at her hand. This is when God avenged those saints under the altar, not only them, but if you remember, he said in the sixth chapter there, we'll go back to that. I'm hoping it's helpful that I'm showing you the scriptures as we go. Um, they're saying here in the 10th verse, and they cried with a loud voice saying, how long? O oh Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Well, obviously, these people were not. They, these people, I'm saying, are martyrs. They're dead in the grave. They're, this God is just showing I'm aware of this situation, that a vengeance is... Uh, will need to be applied. But he tells them in the 11th verse, white robes were given to every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, 
until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. It wasn't a little season from the early church to today, 2,000 years, but it was a much shorter period of time after this Catholic church and these martyrs uh, after the 1500s. And actually, it was 1798 when the Pope was put in prison and stopped his rule over the Eastern world. And so then the Reformation started and the judgment of God uh, there will be down here in the restored church, but there will not be, uh, we, we will not, uh, we won't, in other words, we're going to be persecuted severely. The church will be down here. Once the church is restored, there'll be great persecution. Uh, because those that, you know, they're, they're not going to, any more than the Jewish world accepted Christ and the body of Christ, that won't be accepted down here any more than it was back there. Uh, it, today, our governmental systems are totally against the church, and they'll certainly be against the body of Christ because it will bring judgment on them. Uh, in fact, I heard where, uh, just today, where a, a, Jew, a Jewish rabbi, that is a, a, he's, he's, he's a Messianic Jew, he said, America missed it. They missed the warning of 9 11. They, they didn't realize God was in that. God was warning them. God put a woe on the, on the American uh, nation, on the United States. And I said, yes, and they're missing it again in this pandemic. They're not, they're not even considering that God, that what God is doing right now to the world and, and that God's judgment is, you know, it's not even, we're not even exempt in the body of Christ. Judgment, Peter said, judgment first must begin at the house of God. God is, you know, God's asking us to, to clean up our lives and, uh, and so uh, he said to them, white robes were given to every one of them, but told them, they're go you're going to have to wait. The reason they had to wait for God to take vengeance is because Babylon had in no way developed into its fullness of iniquity and wrongdoing and working outside of God's order. And God couldn't judge that because it, it wasn't ready to judge. God wasn't ready to judge it. He wasn't ready to get his people out of it. It wasn't time to judge that eternally. But here in the 19th chapter that I just mentioned, where uh, it showed that, uh, here, let me let this in, okay. Right here in the second verse, for true and righteous are his judgments, for he had judged the great whore. Sorry, but that's Bible, it's harlot system, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants. God is going to avenge those that were persecuted and martyred uh, by the Catholic Church, and he's going to avenge the blood of those that will be persecuted down here. There will be there will be great persecution down here. And God will judge the system when it comes to its full and fullness of iniquity. So uh, uh, that's why that question came up. Where are these people? Well, this people is not talking about the early church. The early church, those that made the bride are in heaven, as I showed you this man that was revealing more information about the Gentile world to John here in the book of Revelations. Um, and so that led to Jesus coming in judgment down here in the same way he came back there. Um, Matthew, let's, let me go to Matthew 24 here. And, um, you know, I don't know if I want to be, I mean, I'm, I, I am welcoming anyone that, wants to 
uh, ask a question, but I don't want, I want to try to stay on the subject since I've got it going. Um, so just, you know, for clarification, somebody wants to know, you know, uh, I'm looking right here. Somebody may help me where Jesus is coming in clouds. I believe he says that. It's either in Matthew or Luke. Yeah, I know it's right here in the 30th verse. Jesus is explaining in the 24th chapter of Matthew, the 13th chapter of Mark, the 21st chapter of Luke. These are all these three different men explaining what Jesus said about the end of the Jewish world. And, of course, what he was saying here was um, they're asking him the question, how are we going to know when the end, uh, verse 14, and the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall come the end. So if you read that, you might think that that's talking about the end of the whole world, but it's not. It's talking about the end of the Jewish world back there. In fact, I've made this statement several times that almost every scripture talking about the end of the world and the last days in the New Testament is talking about back there 2,000 years ago in the end of that world. Um let me give you a scripture here in Hebrews, the first chapter for an example. That's just one scripture, but there's many. Paul opens up the book of Hebrews, the first chapter and first verse. It says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, just means at different times and different manners, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by the Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. That last days is back there. He's not talking to us. He's talking to Hebrews 2,000 years ago in this letter. And he's telling them that in these last days that we're living in, God has spoken to us by his Son, not like he did in time past by the to our fathers by the prophets, but now Jesus has come to this world, and now he's spoken to us by his son and has appointed him as heir to all things. So uh, uh, that's just one example of the fact that, that the last days and the end time is, and I could go through every one of them and show you that it's obvious that it it is talking about the end of the Jewish world 2,000 years ago. It's not talking about the end of our world. Uh, so he's explaining to them how the end of their world is going to come. He said, and ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place who readeth, let him understand. He's talking about AD 70 right there, where God judged the Jewish world in AD 70 his judgment was poured out on Jew, on the Jews and the gospel was given to the Gentiles because they had, he got everything out of Judaism he could get out of it and everyone else rejected him. And so he, he went to the Gentiles and the Gentiles started a new 2000 year world. Uh, and it was in uh, a dark period of time among us Gentiles. We're still not in a restored church. We're still not where God is going to give us a church like the New Testament church. We haven't got there yet, but I do believe that we're getting closer to that place. For time's sake, I'll move down to the 30th verse, and he tells him, and there shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall be the tribes of the earth the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he'll send his angels, that's his apostles, with great a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. This coming of the Son of Man in clouds of heaven 
that took place on the day of Pentecost. Clouds, I'll, I'll say some more about it here in a minute, but clouds represent, uh, it represents the divine order of God. God, God has always used clouds in prophecy uh, to show his, his divine order. You know, even in when he brought the children of Israel across uh, the wilderness, when they when he got them, when he delivered them from Egypt, he spoke to them in in a cloud. Uh, he spoke to Moses when he gave him the Ten Commandments. Uh, he appeared to him in a cloud uh, when he gave the Ten Commandments. Um, the uh, after he was given the the uh, uh, the order of the of the tabernacle and the order of the priesthood, the high priest once a year was to offer up sins for the people on the day of atonement. In the end of the year, every year, uh, he would offer up an atonement to erase everyone's sin and forgive them of their sins uh, for that year past and start off clean in a new year with a new slate. Uh, when he went in to the holy place, he would burn incense on the altar, the golden altar of incense. He would take coals off of the brazen altar out in the uh, out in the uh, outer court, which which we call a type of first heaven, which we're in right now. And and that priest would take uh, he would take incense. It would have to be a special mixture. It represented that incense burnt in the holy place represented the righteousness of the saints and the prayers of the saints. See, you and I, our prayers are always trying to ask God to help us in our uh, in our walk, in our serving Him, in our relationship with Him helping us with how we, uh, a lot of times our prayers are, like James said, we ask amiss because we heap it upon our own lust. We're asking for things we want. We're not really considering, what do you want, Lord? What do you, what do you want in my life? What, what do you want my next step to be? What, what are you asking of me? What, what further knowledge and understanding of do you, are you asking me to come to and growth what growth stage or am i uh are you requiring of me to whom much is given much is required and so our prayers have to do with our relationship with god that helps us develop in god's righteousness so and that's what that incense uh represents that the whole that the high priest offered up, that incense uh, was that was from the coals of the altar where sacrifices were given, and this incense it was made up of of uh, myrrh and uh, I don't know maybe somebody could help me with the, some of the words there, but. Um, but it was a special mixture and it had to be that exact mixture. And that represents that there, you know, we have got to, we've got to find favor with God according to his will, according to his word, his truth, according to the right spirit, not man's spirit, but God's spirit, God's leading. Uh, and so, and, and then, that causes an incense that goes up before God that he accepts. He won't accept it any other way. It has to be done right. It has to be according to the pattern that God gives in the Bible. Well, when that priest, he, there was a curtain. You know, when you first went into the holy place, there was a curtain. You went in behind that curtain. 
that took you in the holy place. Then there was another curtain between it and the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant, the, the, the two stones of Ten Commandments, Aaron's bud that, that uh, rod that budded, uh, indicating the life of the anointing of God's spirit that was in his ministry to minister to the people. We had two cherubims that overshadowed the, the ark. Those two cherubims represent God and Christ as well as the Old and New Testaments because that's the word of God. That's his character. That's who he is, he and his son. And they overshadow that holy of holies. And for that high priest to go in there, he had to offer up incense on those coals of altar. And then that would begin to cause incense to rise. He would reach and take the, the curtain and pull it over the golden altar and let the Holy of Holies fill up with a cloud. He wasn't allowed to go in there without a cloud. And then he went inside and offered up an atonement, the blood of atonement for the people. Uh, so uh, 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 what I'm trying to show you is this altar that these souls were under was the brazen altar in the, in the holy, in the outer court. It was not the golden altar. There's no sacrifice offered there and there's no souls under it. Every soul of sacrifice is is burnt on the brazen altar in the outer court. That's where we're we're offering up sacrifices, and we're going through a process that that the tabernacle or temple shows. Uh, but these souls here were, uh, and so Jesus he was telling them here in the twenty fourth chapter of of Matthew that the son of man would come in clouds of heaven. He came back there in a cloud. Uh, and, you know, on in the book of Acts, um, you know, and I know, I think everybody here has heard me go through the little illustration of how Jesus is not coming back in, in a literal cloud. He's not coming back in clouds, not literally. This has symbolic meaning to it. But in the book of Acts, if you go to the first chapter of Acts, um, uh, okay, in verse nine here, it says after Jesus told them to go and wait in the upper room and that they'd receive power to be with, uh, uh, the Holy Ghost would come up on them, they'd receive power to be with witnesses unto me in both Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. Verse nine, he says, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld him, he was taken up in a cloud and received him out of his, their sight. While they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, so shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Well, I think that's where most of religion, a lot of religion, thinks Jesus is going to come down to cloud level and catch up his bride. Well, he was caught in, he was literally caught up right there into the heavens, and a cloud received him out of their sight. He evidently went up into a cloud and they didn't see him anymore. You know, I fly airport, I've I've been a pilot for many, many years. Had, I think I've had five airplanes and, and I've flown into many clouds. And when a plane goes into the clouds, you can't see it anymore. And so, so I've I've been in the what we call as a pilot, I've been in the soup a lot of times. That's that's talking about being up in the clouds where you can't see, flying by instruments. Anyway, Jesus did go there in a literal cloud, but when this angel told them, these these angels said, Why are you looking up? 
he's going to come in like manner. So therefore, I heard a preacher in this body not too long ago say Jesus is coming down to cloud level and going to receive his bride members. Well, I'm sorry, that's not going to happen that way. That, that uh, he is coming in clouds. If you if you look in in uh, Revelations one, I'm just kind of shooting from the hip here tonight, so had to bear with me while I one and seven right here. It says, "Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him." That's talking about the Jews that hung him on a cross. That you know said crucify and all the all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him even so amen well where he's coming right there in clouds that's not talking about he's not coming in, in a literal cloud that's a symbolic cloud of a restored church let me i can get i can give you i think i've got seven, 16 or 17 scriptures on this but um but let me look in Revelations 14. This ought to be some help because time's not going to prevent us to go through the whole teaching probably. But here John in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelations, and this is, this is after the church is restored. The church, the last prophetical hour starts in, and it opens up in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelations. And uh, here in the 14th chapter, it shows uh, three messages, I believe. Uh, um, let me see. Yes. Um, there's three messages of the early church, restored church. The first one is... Uh, and this is a ministry. Look in verse six. And I saw another angel, that's messenger, fly in the midst of heaven. Look, let me show you your messenger. See, this is Strong's number of definition of Greek words. This is, could be an angel. It was interpreted an angel 179 times, a messenger seven times. Uh, here. It's a messenger, especially an angel by implication, implication, a pastor, angel, messenger. So this, this is not talking about third heaven angel. This is talking about a ministry saying Babylon is fallen. Uh, well, no, let me go back up. Uh, fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. That's what we're working for. We're all laboring for the, the gospel that lasts forever. Now, when one preacher's preaching one thing and another preacher's preaching something else, somebody's lying. Somebody is not, does not have the truth answer. You can't preach two separate things and be, both of you be right. But the gospel that's going to last forever is the truth. That's the truth of God's word that we have got to come to. We have got to come to the place. I think we have a lot of knowledge, but I don't think we've got it all yet. I think we got to realize that God's not through restoring the New Testament church. And so here is showing that there's a ministry that's going to have the everlasting gospel, the truth. And their first message is in, in, in verse 7, fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgments come. That's the last prophetical hour. That's a 15-year period. Then, verse 8, the next message they have is Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That's in the 18th chapter of the book of Revelation where God is going, he gives more detail on this, showing how Babylon is in a fallen condition and God's going to get his people out of it. The word Babylon means confusion. Um, it's uh, right here, Babylon. Babylon equals confusion. That's what it means, and, and it's a confused condition that this, Christ, this world of Christianity out here is in. You've got all these different organizations. It's not God's order. They're separated. They believe different things. That's confusion, saints. I don't, 
it, we can't we can't make anything better out of it than that. Uh, we we all have been a part of it, and but you got to somewhere come to the revelation of understanding that God's got to get us out of that. Israel was confused when Jesus came. He brought everyone out of that into one body, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one spirit. They didn't have confusion. They had the understanding that God gave them. Remember what I read to you in Joel 2, that there never been a people like that on the face of the earth and never shall be even the many generations. That indicates us down here in a restored church. So um, then their third message is, is third angel right here saying, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same will drink of the wrath of the wine of the wrath of God. So there's three messages of the restored church. Fear God. What does that tell you? It should tell you that we don't fear God enough. If a restored church is going to start off with that message, that's going to put us in a greater relationship with God because we're going to have a greater awe, a greater fear. That's a righteous fear. It's not being afraid of God, but it is being afraid of not heeding to his call, his righteousness. Uh, and so God is going to require more of us when the church is fully restored. And then uh, then the next message will be Babylon uh, is fallen and God will begin to gather people out of Babylon into, into his body, his restored church. And then the message will be don't take the mark. That's, that's, there's going to be a mark of the, the beast system is coming up. Uh, and so we could say a whole lot about more, more about that right now, but uh but here, what I wanted to read in the 13th verse, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Notice that there is a time that it's more blessed to die in the Lord at a certain time and rest from your labors, that's entering into the rest or the Sabbath. That is to uh, enter into a perfection, to overcome and become a, a mature saint of God, a bride member. And then look what he said, and I looked and behold, verse 14, a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like unto the son of man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. See, that ought to tell you right there, Jesus, that's not a literal cloud. Jesus isn't coming back riding on a cloud. That's symbolic. He's coming back on a restored church in a heavenly condition. And, um, and, and he's got a golden crown on his head. That's symbolic. That's talking about the authority of the word of God. It's as pure as gold. And in his hand, a sharp sickle. That's the word of God. And his hand is the ministry, the fivefold ministry apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists. And, uh, and he's going to reap. Now, see, everything about this is symbolic. This is not talking about a literal sickle. It's not talking about literally a harvest, a literal harvest of wheat or barley. This is talking about a spiritual harvest of God's people. And, and he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. God's going to have a restored ministry with the power of God like the early church ministry that will reap in the last prophetical hour, this, this, this harvest of God will be reaped down here. 
God's ministry with the word of God, the sharp sickle. And so God is coming. He's coming in a cloud, <clears throat> symbolic cloud, <clears throat> not a, uh, if you go back to uh, Hebrews 12, in the first verse, we start right there. Here's another cloud I want to mention. Uh, <clears throat> now, in the 11th chapter, God starts off in the 11th chapter of the book of, or, or Paul does, in the 11th chapter, starting out with righteous Abel and showing the Old Testament worthies that by faith, by faith they serve God. Uh, and, and he shows in the very last verse, verse 39 and 40 here, he said, all these, these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. That was the promise of the Holy Ghost. They were not born again of God's spirit. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. It would take them resurrecting back there after Jesus' resurrection. Remember, Jesus told Caiaphas, the high priest, he said, you're going to see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob set down in the kingdom of heaven, and ye yourself thrust out. The, the saints of God, the Old Testament worthies resurrected back there. They could not be made perfect or finish the work of God without what the early church had. They had to have the new covenant that Christ came. They had to be born again. They had to uh, be born of God's nature. They were only born of Adam. Uh, there's no life in Adam. And so they had to be born again, and they had to finish. And here in the 12th uh, chapter, in the first verse, Paul says, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. He's talking about all of those people of faith that God brought them forth back there in that early church to make them perfect under the new covenant. And then look, we're compassed. He's saying back there, they were compassed about with a cloud of witnesses. These are spiritual people that God has, has brought through faith to finish the work in them. That cloud there is, it's talking about an operation of God's uh, uh, divine order that was working in these witnesses. Even in the Old Testament, it was symbolic. They were a cloud of people. They were a people that uh, were from a heavenly, um, I'll say a heavenly relationship with God, a heavenly place symbolically. It was a cloud. Uh, and, and God showed himself that way through the Old Testament. But then in the New Testament, it's even made more clear that, that he's coming in a cloud. Well, let's see. Here, I'll give you, a, here's a scripture in Psalms 104, uh, three, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters and maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh on the, upon the wings of the wind, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. See, uh, he laid the foundation of the earth. It, God, this, this, this is symbolic language. He, he's not riding on a cloud in a chariot, uh, making the clouds his chariots. That's talking about symbolic heavenly condition. Let's see, Proverbs 16, 15. In the light of the king's countenance, his life and his favor is as a cloud of the latter rain. That's, you'd have to understand the spiritual meaning, but it's talking about bringing forth a harvest with a cloud of the latter rain. And in Joel 2, don't you remember, it starts out saying a day of darkness, a day of, of heaviness, clouds of the morning. It's that, that's, 
that's not, it wasn't a cloudy day on the day of Pentecost necessarily. It was just showing symbolically that there was a rain of God, the clouds were going to bring forth rain God's, of God's divine order. Uh, I already mentioned Daniel 24, 30. Here Daniel 7 said, I saw in the night vision, behold, one like unto the Son of Man came with me that, with the cloud of clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before me. This is Daniel was getting, you know, God was revealing something to Daniel. Matthew 26, 63. But Jesus held his peace and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the son of Christ. And Jesus said, thou hast said, nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter you shall see the son of man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. That it's just, you know, the more you read it, the more you understand this has to be symbolic. It can't be talking about literal clouds. The Son of Man shall come in glory of his Father with his angels, and then the, he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there shall, be, uh, there shall be some standing here which shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven. See, Jesus came back on the day of Pentecost. That was symbolically him coming in clouds him coming in a spiritual condition like that. Now, 1 Thessalonians 4.17, I think it would be good if we brought this scripture up because 1 Thessalonians 4, and I'm going to try to wind this up right here, but Paul was telling this new church in Thessalonica, Thessalonica, they were wondering, what if we die and we haven't overcome and made the bride? What's going to happen to us? He tells them, uh, he tells them if you go back here in the 13th verse, uh, I won't have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them that are asleep, that you saw not even as others which have no hope. See, they're thinking, if we, what happens if we die? That was my question when I came to the body of Christ and found out the qualification to make the bride. I said, what if I die and I ain't made it? <laughs> That's when I need to know something about the resurrection. So he's telling them, don't sorrow for them like you'd sorrow for people that has no hope. Uh, for he says in verse 14, if you believe Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, will, God will bring with him. That means if you're sleeping Jesus, you know, when Lazarus died, Jesus told his apostles, he said, Lazarus sleepeth. They never they didn't understand him. He finally said, Lazarus is dead. For then, verse 15 says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or go before them which are asleep or that have died before us. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, that's the highest messenger, Christ, and with the trump of God, that's the seventh trumpet, the last trump, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That catching up into the clouds is catching up in a restored church. The same clouds Jesus came in in the end of, and judged the Jewish world in the end of that world. He's going to We'll be caught up in that, in the clouds, in that divine order of God in a restored church down here. And those that have died before us, he'll bring with him in a resurrection. That's the resurrection of the just. To meet the Lord in the air, that is, if you, you know, you, you all, you've heard Paul talk about the, the prince of the power there. In other words, the way that's in the world, what, what's can present 
in the world. Well, we will we'll be we'll meet the Lord in the that present condition of a restored church. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words he's telling them. So that he's coming in clouds right there is what he's talking about when he says he's coming in clouds. Um, Revelations 11, I'll give you this one. 11, 12, it says, and these were the two witnesses. You know, the church fell away. The, 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 there was nothing left but the outer court for the Gentiles. Read, start it in the first verse. The, and uh, the outer court was trodden underfoot by the Gentiles for 1260 years, 42 months or three and a half years. Well, that is, that's talking about the church falling away. That's, the, that's when the Catholic Church, the pale horse era. And, uh, but the two witnesses, the Old and New Testament lay dead in the streets. And, uh, but God would not suffer them to be done away with. And after three and a half days, right here, verse 11, after three and a half days, three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet. And great fear fell upon them, which saw them. Now, that's when the Reformation started after the three and a half days, which represents three and a half years or 42 months or 1260 days, which is prophetical years. That's the end of the Catholic age. After that, when the Reformation started, they heard a great voice. Uh, Let's see, where, wait just a minute. That, that first, after three and a half days, the spirit of life of God entered into them and they stood up on their feet and great fear fell on all them that saw them. That is the reformation when there was no, death was the rider of the horse. But after that, the anointing of God was on those reformers and those two witnesses, the old and two, nest, uh, old and two, old and new testaments. And I got that out. Okay. They stood up on their feet. In other words, they, God gave strength again to those two witnesses with an anointing of those reformers that began to get truths and began to, uh, the reformation uh, that would find, that will finally lead to the restored church, which we're not there yet. They ascended. And then there comes there, uh, verse 12 said, and they heard a great voice from heaven saying, come unto them, come unto them. Let me read it. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. That's the restored church. There is, they, they ascended in a cloud. That's a restored church. I'm telling you, all these scriptures alludes to this. And Jesus is coming back on, he's coming back on that cloud in that restored church to reap, uh, to reap the earth and to finish the harvest. But from the time they stood up on their feet was back in Martin Luther's day to right now, we're hearing a voice that's saying, come up hither. But we haven't made it up that we haven't made it up to a restored church that cloud condition yet and the same hour was a great earthquake in the tenth part of the city fell well that earthquake i'm telling you is the same earthquake as in the sixth chapter of the book of revelation um i'll say this one more time for those of you that maybe not have grasped it yet here's the way the seals are in the book of revelation the first six seals are in summary form. They are synoptic, similar to indexes to a book. They just give you a little, what, here's, what, here's what's in the book. That's number one. Number two, here's what's in the book. Number three, the sixth seal has much more information than the first five seals because it 
it has to do with the whole end of the Gentile world and the millennial reign. It finishes the work of God completely, those first six seals, in synoptic summary form. The seventh seal opens in the eighth chapter, and that, from the eighth chapter, the seventh seal opens, and it's open to the end of the book, in the 22nd chapter of the book of Revelations. It never closes. And it it's full of detail from the eighth chapter, the 22nd chapter of everything that's in those first six seals. It's on those first synoptic summary indexes that just gives us a little inkling of what the book's about. But the, 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 the seventh seal opens up all the detail and explains exactly what's gonna happen. That's how the seals work. Well, anyway, that's probably enough for tonight. It's, uh, um, I really haven't went over time. We're going to start at 7.30, and we waited for several people to get in, and uh, several people come in late, and I appreciate that. I appreciate everybody that's been able to be with us tonight. Um, let's see. I probably could stop sharing right here. There you go. So I went over this. Good to see Brother Rodriguez from Brownsville, some of the people, and uh, we went over a big part of this Monday night in our Zoom meeting, so he's double dipping tonight. <laughs> but I, I did feel, uh, you know, to maybe cover this again while it was kind of fresh on my mind because those questions came up. Uh, I might mention here in closing that question on the sixth chapter of the book of Revelations and the 17th verse, oops, sixth chapter and 17th verse, that says, um, did I lose y'all? Let me see, here we go. All right. That says, for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? And I gave that verse in, uh, Malachi 2 concerning, now this, this is concerning the early church, what Malachi had to say. Um, where did he say? Is that in the third, maybe the third chapter? Let me see if it's not the third chapter. Yeah. What it says is, is I'll send my messenger that, that's John the Baptist, and he'll prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of his covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the host. But who shall abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand? Who shall stand when he appeareth? For he's like a refiner's fire. He's going to purify you and put you through the heat. And like fuller's soap, he's going to. He's going to wash you by the water of the word and he'll set as a refiner and purifier of silver and he'll purify the sons of Levi as the ministry of the early church. That's just, you know, Le the Levi, that's where the priest, but this is, this is a symbolic prophetical message showing that he was going to purify ministry and purge them as gold and silver. Gold in the Old Testament, symbolic of wisdom, and silver, symbolic of understanding. And they that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness, that they shall, then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, as in the former years, and I will come near to you to judgment, and I'll be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers and false swearers and against them that oppose the hireling in wages, the widow and the fatherless, and they that turn aside from strangers from his right and fear not me, saith the Lord. You know, what he said there is he would, uh, uh, concerning the widow and the fatherless, you know, James said that pure religion is undefiled as those that uh, uh, what does it say that they 
I can't get that in my mind exactly concerning the widows and fatherless, that they, they that serve the widows and fatherless. Uh, and that's talking about, that's not talking about literal widows and literal, literal orphans. It's talking about churches that don't have a proper ministry that their ministry is dead, that doesn't have any life in that ministry. And the fatherless children that are without the proper ministry and proper fatherly overseeing that would raise them up in righteousness. That's what James was talking about. And that's what he's talking about here. Uh, that he would have against, against those that oppress the hiring and his wages, the widow and the fatherless and that, that oppress them, that turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me, saith the Lord. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. So anyway, there will be a day of God's wrath and he will bring, he will bring vengeance in that time frame uh, of a restored church to bring about true and righteous judgment in the earth and to bring about bride members that, that reach full maturity in righteousness. Anyway, um, maybe before we go home tonight, we could, we could say a prayer. Uh, Brother, Brother Lewis in Norfolk, Virginia's little grandson, five years old, has got leukemia, and he's got the worst kind of leukemia. He's already started chemotherapy, I'm leaving that right, Brother Rodriguez. And uh, he's very, very sick and a lot of pain. We need to pray for him. Brother Ray Weaver is in the hospital on the vent. He does have COVID. His kidneys are working the last I heard yesterday, though. Uh, he, he was on 40 and 50% oxygen. I think they cranked it up to 60 and even 70%. He's not and of course, you know, he's not in good condition at all. He had kidney cancer. He had a kidney removed and, and uh, he's got a heart condition. So he certainly needs our prayers. Brother Goss in Keswick, Canada is, I think he's back home. Is that right, Sister? Uh, is he back in the hospital, Sister McNabb, or is he home now? They have him in um, uh, rehab for a They've tried it for a month to see how he's doing, and he seems to be doing. I spoke to Brother Bai after I was speaking with you, and uh -huh. Brother Bai went to see him today. And he said he had um, a good conversation with him and that it was only near the end. I guess he started to say something, and, and he started, the agitation started to come up. So Brother Bai gave a good report. Good. But Let's Brother, keep... Brother Bai was didn't say anything that could send him out of kilter with the way he is. Right. Well, I know he still needs your prayers, and I know yeah. that the people there in Cash would appreciate us continue praying for him. So let's be sure to do that. Sister uh, Julie Crafton, of course, has had this stroke. She is doing much, much better. Uh, she was in church Sunday without a wheelchair, with a walker, and so she's, she's continuing to improve, but let's keep praying for her. Sister Crow, uh, she had a mini stroke. She's at home. She's at actually her daughter's got her in her home taking care of her right now. And, uh, but she's been improving some. She had a UTI. She's over that. Um, but uh, anyway, she certainly does need her prayer she's what 95 years old and and she just knows she can't she told me over and over in the last month I know I'm not going to be able to continue forever keep coming to church I'm just too weak but she said I'm going to come as long as I can so we're we're trying to pray with her and she's certainly a blessing when she, you know when she's there so remember that um any other urgent needs uh, I know that everybody's got needs. We need to pray for the body of Christ. There's a meeting coming up in Convention Center uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. And so we need to pray about that. Also, this COVID condition, you know, we just all want to continue to be uh, 
you know, we want to exert as much safety as we can. Just be careful. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we've just been so fortunate so far. We had not had it in our church. Brother Weaver's in the hospital with COVID, but he didn't get it in our church. He hadn't been to church probably three months, two or three months. It's been some time. He was there maybe a month ago, maybe he came for a service, but he, he didn't have COVID then. He got, he, his wife got COVID and he got it and they, they hadn't been to church before they had it or even after, but they're both over it. Now he's over it, but he's got pneumonia. He's, you know, got, I think, COVID and regular pneumonia. So he certainly needs our prayers. Uh, why don't everybody, let's all unmute our phone, our microphones and pray together here tonight. Give God a, a praise and, and thanks. It's a time of Thanksgiving, but it's also a time for us all to pray. So everyone unmute your phone, your, your microphones. Does everybody know how to do that? To go up to your little three dots there on your screen and hit unmute and not mute. I'm looking at all of you and I ain't seeing anybody unmute yet. I'm waiting to see that. <laughs> oh, you're doing, we're doing better. We've been muted. muted. Huh? Yeah. yeah. See, everybody's doing better. See, I can see if you guys did it or not. Video. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right, let's all pray together here tonight. Oh, God, bless it, Lord. Jesus, we love you. Lord, God, we're thankful for your goodness and the good word of God. Jesus, truth, help us to know. Oh, God, help us to do your will, to serve you in a greater way this day and hour that we're living in. These urgent needs, Lord. Oh, God, this little grandson of Brother Lewis, Jesus, that child, we're asking you, Lord, if you would heal him. And Brother Weaver, God, touch Brother Weaver in his condition. If you'd give him a little more time, oh, God. Brother Bill Daniels, Lord, God, touch him, this condition in his body. Brother Durham, touch him and heal him of his condition, Lord. Sister Julie Kraft, oh, God, touch her. Sister Crow, these churches, Lord, in Keswick, Brother Goss, touch Brother Goss today, Lord. God, remember his faithfulness to you, Lord Jesus. Help him, oh God, in this time. You're our present help in the time of need. You're our great physician. You're our shield and our buckler. You're the one and the only one that we trust and, and have hope in, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, Lamb of God, we give you praise tonight. We thank you for your goodness to us. God, touch your people. Go with your people, Lord. Bless them, oh God. Lead them in your righteousness. And uh, touch their, their goings in and coming out, oh God. Coming in and going out. Touch them, Lord. Touch this body, this meeting that Brother Gillespie is planning in, in uh, Convention Center in Louisville, Kentucky. God, watch over your ministry and your churches in the body of Christ. And your needs. We give you praise tonight. Thank you, Lord. God, for your goodness. Hallelujah. All right. God bless all of you saints. I appreciate every one of you and your ministers. And thank you for uh, your ear for, for letting me talk to you. God bless you. I'll you see you. Too. Those of you that are local, I'll see you uh, Sunday morning. Breakfast at 9.30. Bible study at 10. I ain't got that across to everybody, seems like. Seems like they don't know that Bible study is part of church. So I'm Ooh. trying to reiterate that to help people to understand how we actually do yeah. it. It's Bible study broken by a little, just a, you know, a little recess. And then we go into service, worship service upstairs. So uh, I'll see you at 930 breakfast, eggs, biscuits, gravy, uh, sausage, uh, what I got, cereal, coffee, juice.
<laughs> My Lord, makes me want to go right now. <laughs> God bless your hearts. I'll see you God soon. Bless you. Thank you. Have a good <laughs> night. God bless. Stop the recording. Uh, yeah. Oh, God.